Hey everybody, welcome to Connecticut River Conservancy's live stream series, now in season two, episode two, Hydropower in Massachusetts, Do Rivers Need Water and Fish Need Elevators? My name is Stacy Leonard and I'm the events coordinator here at CRC. We really appreciate all of you for joining us today and excited to see such great interest in this topic. Livestream is now our primary venue for bringing our work and our rivers to you, wherever you may reside. You can find all of our past and future episodes on our website at ctriver.org slash livestream. And I'll be sharing this link in a follow-up email after the presentation. Just a couple of details before we move on. Uh, we encourage you to ask your questions and type them in the chat box and we'll field them at the end of the program. If we don't have time for all your questions, we'll be hosting a follow-up Zoom coffee hour on Friday, February 5th at 1030. And again, I'll share all of this info and all the links and every little detail that you need to know for afterwards um, in an email that you'll receive later today. Uh, we are also recording this presentation for later access and that gets posted on our live stream site within 24 to 36 hours. So today's presentation is going to cover the ins and outs of hydropower relicensing in Massachusetts. CRC has been advocating for stronger protections for our rivers for nearly nine years. And since relicensing comes up once every 40 or 50 years, there's a lot at stake for the preservation and conservation of aquatic animals, humans, and culture. We hope this presentation will help clarify the hydro relicensing process currently underway in Massachusetts its effects on the entire watershed and how we can all add our voices to push for stronger outcomes for our rivers. Here to break down the details for us is Andrea Donlin, CRC's river steward in Massachusetts since 2003, tirelessly working on this topic. Also on the call, we have Kathy Erfer, our river steward in New Hampshire and Vermont, who led a similar conversation live stream uh, two weeks ago about the relicensing process in New Hampshire and Vermont. And again, you can see that recording on our website. So without further ado, I'd love to turn it over to Andrea to take us on this deep dive. Thanks for being here. All right, thank you everybody for coming. Um, just putting up the agenda for today's presentation. Um, I am going to first kind of go over the basics of the hydro relicensing and do an orientation of the um, facilities up for relicensing on the Connecticut River, go through the details of what First Light has proposed in their amended final license application that came out in December, and then um, cover some of the things that we think are lacking or missing in the license application. I'll cover next steps and ways to weigh in and then um, hoping to have enough time for question and answer at the end. And um, there is a lot to cover today. So um, some of this will be whirlwind <laughs> tour, but um, uh, hopefully it'll also be interesting. Um, First, I wanted to cover sort of a bit on why we care about this relicensing proceeding. Um, dams and hydropower projects do uh, provide energy that we all use and carbon free energy, but they do have a lot of impact on rivers. Um, a river without dams um, has an equilibrium. There's free flowing rivers. There's the water temperature stays nice and cool. It's good, provides good habitat for spawning and fish can freely move up and down. Um, when you put a dam in the way that changes the river's dynamic greatly, um, it creates a lake that um, changes the water quality. It traps sediment. Fish cannot move up and down. Um, and it, it really just changes the whole character of the river. The Connecticut River um, is 410 miles long, um, New England's largest, longest river. Um, and there are a lot of hydropower projects on the river. There are five going up for relicensing right now. Three of them are in New Hampshire and Vermont. They are owned by Great River Hydro. 
And in fact, there's a bunch of facilities upstream of those three that um, are not going through relicensing now, but they do affect the flows of everything downstream. One of the biggest projects is 15 Mile Falls. Um, and you can see how much power each one of them generates. In Massachusetts, the two facilities that we're going to be talking about today are Northfield Mountain Pump Storage Project in Northfield and Turner's Falls Dam in Montague and Gill. These are bigger projects, um, especially the pump storage one. So the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is the um, federal agency that uh, coordinates hydropower dam licensing. And um, we call this FERC. So as Stacy mentioned, the license term is for 30 to 50 years. And um, that's a very long time. So the current licenses um, are old. The Northfield Mountain was uh, went into operation in 1972 and the license was written in 1968. Um, and then the Turner's Falls license was last issued in 1980. So a lot of things have changed. There are new environmental regulations. The power industry is currently in the middle of some pretty dramatic changes as we move to um, reduce carbon footprints, the climate has changed, and um, people's recreation needs and interests have also changed. This uh, picture in the background shows the Turner's Falls Canal, and um, you can see the Great Falls Discovery Center on the left. The law that um, governs hydropower relicensing is the Federal Power Act, and this is the act that created FERC. And it also um, stated that there needs to be equal consideration between um, power and development with other interests, um, such as habitat or recreational opportunities and historic preservation. A relicensing effort under FERC um, takes into account multiple stakeholder values under this equal consideration um, clause. And it's a very complex process with a bunch of different laws and um, interest groups. And um, next I'm gonna just explain a little bit about the owner of Turner's Falls Dam and Northfield Mountain Pump Storage. These um, facilities the company sort of restructured the corporation. So each of the facilities is owned by a separate LLC that's under um, First Light Mass, um, I mean, First Light Power Services LLC. <laughs> and um, this company owns uh, some other facilities in Connecticut. And then th they are all owned by um, a Canadian corporation called PSP Investments, which um, invests funds in pension plans for Canadian federal agencies. So um, now I'm gonna switch to background, like an overview of the facilities and go into what the final license application um, proposes. So this is the Turner's Falls Dam area. Um, you see the flow of the river with this arrow. The Turner's Falls Dam is up at the top of the screen. Um, Barton Cove is one area that's upstream of the dam. And the flows coming down from upriver get split into two different areas. Most of the water goes through the Turner's Falls Canal, which is two, a little over two of a miles long. And um, then the water in the river channel is also called the bypass reach because it's bypassed by um, basically the canal. Power is generated at two locations. Um, station one is further up the canal. It is much smaller, has five little generators. Um, and then Cabot Station at the end of the canal sends most of the water back 
into the Connecticut River and it's a much larger facility with six units. Um, based on the information that we knew at the beginning of the process and then through um, a lot of studies that were done for relicensing, we have known and know now that um, more water is needed in the river channel. Um, we need better fish ladders to move migratory fish upstream. And um, the canal is, a, is kind of a problematic place for migratory fish to be. They waste time and energy being stuck in the canal for some reason. Um, we also were looking for reduced impacts to federal and state listed species. There's a federally endangered short-nosed sturgeon in the area of Cabot Station and, and downstream. There are also some state listed dragonfly species and um, there's a federally endangered Puritan tiger beetle quite a bit downstream in Northampton at a beach called Rainbow Beach. Um, but the river fluctuate or the fluctuation of flow from Cabot Station does impact the water level at this beach. Um, so that was also a focus of relicensing. We um, need sort of recreation amenities for the next 50 years and also a better recognition of the uh, cultural heritage of the area. Turner's Falls Dam is actually um, two different dams separated by a natural island called Great Island. So on the gill side, there are three tainter spillway gates. These um, are used mainly to spill huge amounts of water that come downriver during either major um, rain events or in the spring. And then on the Montague side, there are four bascule gates. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up because the proposal mentions bascule gate number one a few times, and that's the one that you can see water flowing down. Um, if you were a <laughs> migratory fish heading down river, you could imagine that at this flow, um, which is 500 cubic feet per second, that it you might not make it once you crash into the, the dam structure. So, and then this, I don't have a slide of this, but um, if water, the water that's diverted into the canal goes through a gatehouse structure. And this um, kind of gives a better close up of the dam area, showing the top of the canal and um, just below the dam. So I will go through the proposal of what the license application says the first light will do. Um, for fish upstream fish passage, they're proposing to put in a new spillway lift. The spillway is basically another word for dam. So a lift would be like a elevator such as what is at the Holyoke Dam now. And they will also put um, in an eel way for eels. There will be more water spilled from the dam. And also um, they will eventually dismantle the existing fish ladders. For downstream passage, they're going to put in a plunge pool at that bascule gate number one that I showed in a previous slide um, to try to improve uh, survivability if you're if you're passing over the dam. Also at station number one, they are going to put in a bar rack to prevent fish from getting entrained or going through the turbines. For recreational amenities, First Light is proposing to put in a new river access downstream of the dam. They are also proposing to um, have specific whitewater flow releases on eight Saturdays between the months of July and October. And there will be a website that determines, uh, that helps people determine what the whitewater flows or the flows below the dam are. 
during the paddling season. Um, First Light's also proposing to install heaters at this bascule gate number one to pass the new minimum flows in the winter because right now um, ice forms on them and they, they can't really open and close the bascule gate very well. So this will enable them to do that. So this, there's a lot going on <laughs> in this slide, but um, one of the key elements of this license application is these new flows in the bypass or the river channel. Um, and this is a the really big improvement from what's currently allowed under the new license. Um, up at the top of the slide, it explains what the minimum flows in the bypass currently are, which are very low. Um, between May and the start of the fish passage season, it's 200 cubic feet per second. Um, during the fish passage season, it goes up to 400, which is extremely low. Um, then it goes down to 120 between July and November. And this time of year, there's no flow required in the bypass region. There's a little bit of leakage here and there, and then the Fall River comes in just below the dam. But as people are familiar with um, in the area, just like you can often see, it's very rocky and bony, and there's not much water in the river. So, um, the proposal is to change things quite a bit depending on the season and I'm not going to go into all the details of, of why and, and the dates and stuff, but essentially um, you can see in the column called Turner's Falls Dam, that's the amount of water that would get spilled at the dam. And then um, the station number one shows what the, the flows would be coming out at station number one, which is um, further up the canal. So obviously First Light prefers being able to generate power with some of the flows. So they um, will probably be using station number one more than they are now to provide some of those these flows. Um, so the, the flows are going up quite a bit during the fish passage season and then they go back down in the summertime. And over the winter, it'll be 300 CFS, which is an improvement from the no flow that's there now, but it, it's still very low. And um, CRC has been hoping for and, and pushing for flows um, throughout the year that would meet the water quality standards for Massachusetts. So that would be about 1800 CFS. We also um, think that if they're going to put a, a um, new access location for paddling below the dam, um, the river should be navigable throughout the paddling season till you know, the end of October or something, which again would be about 1500 to 2000 CFS. So the summertime flows are um, what we think uh, is too low, but better than what the current license says. Um, moving down to Cabot Station, this is at the end of the Turner's Falls Canal. Um, you can see the river flow direction in the canal. Um, in the middle of the screen is the Cabot Station. The one element of the, the bypass region or the river channel, there's um, an area that's called the Rock Dam, which is a natural feature. Um, that's uh, the focus area for whitewater paddling. Fish going upstream can be delayed here. They can go around the island. Um, and then over on the right side of the screen, you can see the um, Montague City Bridge and um, the Deerfield River comes into the Connecticut on the very right and then the river flows downstream, which is in this photo and angle, it, it's up. So for upstream fish passage, the license application proposes to install a new um, 
an ultrasound of Ray at the Cabot station, which would repel Shad away from the flows that they'd naturally be um, attracted to and have them head upstream um, to the dam where there will be this spillway lift. Um, there will be more water coming downstream in the river channel during migration season to help attract fish up to the dam. And Cabot Station will be held at a certain minimum flow. Basically one of their units will always be on during June. Um, for recreation, they propose to put in some um, long needed upgrades at the Poplar Street boat access. And then um, for habitat purposes, there's going to be some limits on the up ramping rate and the down ramping rate of their various turbines during different seasons to protect um, dragonfly, Puritan tiger beetle, and uh, short nosed sturgeon. Shifting upriver to the Northfield Mountain area. I'm going to give an overview of the locations of things here and then what the license application proposes. Um, Northfield Mountain moves water up and down um, up to the upper reservoir, which is a um, man made reservoir at the top of a mountain and back down into a lower reservoir, which is in this facility's case, the Connecticut River. Um, there are underground, there's an underground powerhouse with four reversible turbines that can either um, pump water uphill or generate power by um, sending the water back down into the river um, at the location of the tail race there. The um, Northfield Mountain actually uses more power to send their water um, upstream than they generate by sending the water downstream. So it's a net loss of energy, but um, it's basically a huge battery and um, has the capability of generating a large amount of power. And it does um, play an important role in the, the grid power grid. So um, going into relicensing and from the, the, the relicensing studies, um, some of the issues with this facility is that there are very large river fluctuations on a daily basis. Um, and these have contributed to erosion problems up and down the river. It's a 20 mile stretch of river between the Turner's Falls Dam and the Vernon Dam. Um, the relicensing studies showed that uh, entrainment or capture of um, juvenile shad and American eel moving downstream in the fall is an issue. And then um, shad eggs and shad larvae also get uh, moved into the turbines. There needs to be reduced impacts to dragonfly species as dragonflies move from their um, aquatic life stage to the adult stage. They emerge from the river and um, dry out their wings and at, for a couple of hours as they're heading up the river bank, they're very um, susceptible to getting wet again. And if they get submerged in water, they, they actually die. Um, and then when there's also a need for sort of the next 50 years planning for recreational amenities. A key thing to point out is just the capability of moving water. There's um, when, when all four units of Northfield Mountain are generating, that sends 20,000 cubic feet per second of water back into the river. And um, so when Northfield is fully on, it can be actually more flow than that's 
in the main stem of the river, especially during the summertime. And this means that um, the river can actually flow upstream at times. When it's in pumping mode, which has been ha mostly happening during the night, um, this you know, reverse happens. I think the maximum is 15,000 cubic feet per second going up in pumping mode, but the river can also flow upstream um, below the, the tail race. So just to go over the um, what the license application proposes for the Northfield Mountain and the Turner's Falls impoundment area. For downstream fish passage, um, they're proposing to stall an a barrier net in front of the Northfield tail race. <clears throat> um, for recreation, they are proposing to put in a new hand carry boat access at the Riverview area. They need to move the Riverview dock for that has the tour boats to make room for the barrier net. And they're also going to put in a new hand carry access location at Cabot Camp. This is a facility that's basically that's at the confluence of the Millers River with the Connecticut, almost underneath the um, French King Bridge. And it's a property that um, First Light already owns. They're proposing to limit the rate of uh, the rate of rise in water level during certain times of year to protect the dragonflies. And um, just to highlight, they are not proposing any change to the rate of the range of fluctuation in the impoundment. So um, the current license and the proposed future license would allow. Um, them to vary the elevation of the river nine feet as measured at the dam. So the license application <clears throat> does address a number of key issues um, and it's fairly strong on addressing these issues below the Turner, Turner's Falls Dam. Um, next, I'm going to highlight a few places where we feel like it's lacking. <clears throat> One of the key areas is the issue of erosion. Um, First Light did a study on it, causation of erosion and concluded that they are not the cause. And they're proposing to use extra capacity in the upper reservoir. And they're going to keep, as I mentioned before, keep the impoundment fluctuation range as is. They are not proposing any mitigation of erosion at all. Under the current license, they have been fixing some bank erosion, but this is not going to continue. Um, we have been, well, first, uh, CRC hired a consultant to evaluate their erosion um, study and found what we think are a lot of flaws in the study and we, we will continue to push for um, a bank management plan. The, the, the graph on the left shows a um, just how much the river fluctuates at a station that's just upstream of the Route 10 bridge. This is something that anybody can look at online in real time. This is a shows you during last summer what the fluctuation pattern was. <clears throat> and although they are proposing several new access locations and new things having to do with recreation, um, we feel like it just didn't go far enough. Uh, the river is used for so many different types of recreation and there are different patterns and recreational needs for the next 50 years than um, what was proposed in the late 60s when the previous recreation plan was written. We also think that First Light um, makes a lot of money out of these facilities 
and can afford to invest a whole lot more in recreation for the region. This graph shows um, our estimate on what they have been making um, just in capacity revenues. And this is a larger subject that um, can't go into full detail right now, but i um, happy to talk to people at other times, but the um, power generating facilities get money uh, or revenue for generating power. And then also they also, there's a, a market in the New England grid system for being sort of ready and on call if needed, which is the capacity market. And Northfield Mountain um, makes more revenue through that than in the generation. And the capacity market prices do go up and down and their license application shows how it's been going, will be going down in the next few years. But um, the last few years, it has been very, very high. And so we estimate that in 2018, 2019, um, the combination of Northfield and Turner's Falls Dam made um, over $130 million just in capacity market, just for that year. Um, the license application pretty much says that the current recreational offerings will stay the same in addition to the new ones, um, but they are proposing to end the rental of cross-country ski equipment. We, um, CRC and a number of different stakeholders, including the Appalachian Mountain Club, have put forward um, a number of additional recommendations. This is something that we filed with FERC um, a couple of years ago. We're looking for annual investments in recreation facilities that are benchmarked to their annual revenue. We're looking for improvements to ADA accessibility. And we'd like the flows below the Turner's Falls Dam to support a walkable portage um, for the whole paddling season. There's an effort to um, make a Connecticut River Paddlers Trail along the whole river with regular campsites and access locations and uh, for people who want to do multi-day trips and we'd like better funding and support for that. We also want to see a commitment that there will be um, the recreation facilities are going to be maintained in optimal condition throughout the license term, not just in the beginning of the license. And we'd like to see continued programming, educational programming um, at the Northfield Mountain Visitor Center. We also had been hoping to see of improvements to the rock dam access uh, because there's a lot of erosion in that area. Um, there's not really a a defined trail to get down there. And um, it is a key area for recreation. And there needs to also be better coordination with the cultural interpretation of the whole area and especially the rock dam area since that will be um, potentially more recreation happening there yet there's a short nose sturgeon habitat and um, culturally sensitive spots. So I'm done with the wrap up of the license application. I'm gonna describe a little bit about what else you can do from here. And then after that, we can open it up for questions. Um, there are, um, so for those of you who live in the project area, it's, um, one way of getting involved is being involved through your town and various committees, um, helping to work on comments. Um, you can also participate by working in coordination with us or as an individual um, person. You can sign up for to be on the FERC uh, 
to get all these filings yourself through FERC, and we can help you do that. There will be a comment period on the license application. FERC has posted that the dates will probably be in the May to July um, time period. At that point, parties can intervene in the license application, make comments, and then also recommendations for the term of the license. Um, at the state level, Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection has to issue a 401 water quality certificate. This is something that's required for all dam um, relicensing. It's a one year process that will probably start in the May to July timeframe. And there's often, there's a comment period at the beginning of that. Um, FERC also will be generating a, an environmental impact statement as part of the relicensing effort. And there will be a comment period for that draft environmental impact, which will come later, um, I think in, in the fall or something. So our website has some information on how to comment to FERC, but feel free to contact me or Kathy if you get confused or bogged down. Um, we as, <clears throat> as sort of an alternative to technical comments, um, CRC has um, been doing this thing called the power of water, power of words, which involves people <clears throat> writing their hopes and dreams of the river on a piece of paper. And then it gets put up on a wall as a way to, um, it's an art installation essentially, but it, it helps sort of increase awareness of, of the issue. And we also have a website where you can post your story or dream or wishes for the river. Um, and this is at powerofwater.fish. These comments would not be the same as filing comments with FERC, but it's just another way of um, putting your thoughts out there. And that concludes the presentation. Um, next we'll have, we have about 20 minutes left for question and answer. Thank you, Andrea. That was very comprehensive and so much detail. And I just want to let folks know that we'll also um, have a PDF of the slides uh, and I'll send those to you in the email that you'll get later. So all the, all the nitty gritty details you can digest a little bit later. So I'm going to turn attention to the chat box and you can continue to ask questions. Um, again, if you feel like we, we run out of time before your question gets answered, we are going to have Kathy and Andrea are offering a coffee hour uh, Zoom chat, more, a little more informal, just conversation on February 5th uh, at 1030. And I'll share information about that in the email as well. So. Um, I'll do my best to interpret the questions. Um, I know people are typing fast. So I think this one says, has the comprehensive study of the impacts of ultrasound been analyzed and disclosed? So um, First Light did study the ultrasound on two different years. The first year they did it, um, it did not Really work very well, and they thought that the um, the shad kind of got used to it. And then they did a second year in which they did more of a pulsing or on-off um, routine, and they came to the conclusion that it worked better. They also, um, on another year, didn't use it at all and just tested whether or not the fish would naturally find their way upstream because of improved flows. Um, and I don't remember, I think that also helped. So they are proposing to do it. I think it still needs um, some verification that it really will work before 
they commit to actually taking out the existing fish ladder. So that's kind of still to be determined. Um, nevertheless, it'd be nice if it did work because for two different reasons. One, um, it keeps the, the fish out of the canal, um, which is a problematic area for them. And then second, first light would only have to commit to building one fish lift at the dam, which is obviously less expensive than having to build multiple fish lifts. Sure. Can I clarify? Thank you, Andrea. Can I just clarify my question? That was my question. Sure. Um, I was curious not only what the intended impacts might have been determined to be, but what adverse effects on the um, biological well be health of the, the, the creatures in the area that would might, might be adversely impacted. Yeah, um, I don't know a whole lot about that. I think that is something that really would have to be looked at as to whether it has negative impacts on other fish such as the short-nosed sturgeon. So um, those, the fisheries agencies will certainly be looking into that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the next question, Does it, doesn't the bank erosion cause extra sediment to move down river towards the dam? I would think that would be a concern for first light. Um, yes, it does. I mean, rivers move sediment and then a, additional erosion does cause <laughs> sediment to move and folks who use the boating areas in Barton Cove have commented to me and it's observable that the river channel is sometimes is filling up the whole Barton Cove area is filling up with sediment and so that's a question that I've had is is does this need to be dredged at some point um, will Annette at the pump storage inlet do anything helpful really uh, another good question. Um, that hasn't been tested. There are other um, pump storage facilities elsewhere that have a net like this. I think there's one in Michigan. Um, First Light has run a test to see how much they get clogged up with uh, a net would get clogged up with debris and leaves and things like that. And um, I think they've concluded that it's still worth pursuing. That's all I can say, I guess. Okay. Um, isn't there a correlation between the wide variation in water release from the Northfield facility and the Cabot Dam releases? I see that in the sec in section of the river south of the Cabot Dam. If I, I read that correctly. Um, I'm not sure I totally understand. Is the question whether the operation of Northfield Mountain, whether it affects the releases at Cabot Station? Yeah, what's the sort of correlation between the two? Um, Or Peggy, if you're there, well, if you want to clarify your question, if I, we're not getting it correct. Well, let me just say that the two facilities definitely have to coordinate with one another. And I'm, I'm not a hydropower operator, but based on my understanding and sitting at meetings and things, um, they, on the one hand, um, Northfield Mountain is somewhat independent in that um, when Northfield Mountain was constructed, they raised the dam at Turner's Falls an extra five to seven feet. And that created this volume of water that Northfield Mountain can use. Um, on the other hand, they wanna make sure that the river level is held in a way that they can still operate the Cabot station and send water through the canal. So. Um, nevertheless, first light says that the flows below Cabot are not impact 
it's by the Northfield Mountain Operation. So this is a little confusing to me just because um, that year that Northfield was not operating in 2010, I think, when they had that sediment debacle. Um, people in Sunderland and Deerfield said that the river was a lot different um, the way it ran. So I'm not really sure, but. Yeah, I'm asking the question because I would see fluctuations in a day of like six feet of the river level. And so if they're allowing a nine foot fluctuation, I'm just trying to figure out where that nine foot fluctuation is and why it's so different from the regulations going forward in Vermont and New Hampshire where they're trying to decrease the fluctuation. Right, yeah, that's a good point. Just to clarify, the, the nine foot fluctuation is in the Turner's Falls impoundment not below Turner's Falls Dam, but there were studies done that showed how much fluctuation does happen, say in Deerfield and Sunderland and downstream. Um, it is pretty dramatic just from the way Turner's Falls Dam and Cabot Station run as peaking facilities. So they are not really addressing that except for the up ramping and down ramping restrictions that I mentioned. However, I don't know whether um, what Great River Hydro is proposing, whether that would have any beneficial effects to the way Turner's Falls and Cabot Station get operated. It's kind of a question, open question I have at the moment. Okay. Does Kathy have any, do you have anything to add about the Great River Hydro aspect at this point? Sorry, I was trying You're to answering answer other questions. questions in the chat, okay. so I, <laughs> I didn't hear really. Um, um, it, it, I will say, you know, Great River Hydro has proposed pretty intense operational changes in there uh, that were put forward in the same time that this application was released from First Light. And so I think an analysis, act, analysis needs to be done from the first light perspective to understand what that means for how the water is flowing down to them. Thanks. Um, uh, regarding the fish elevators, how would they, how are these proposed elevators going to be manned or operated? And will the, will they, will the fish ladders be replaced for sure? Like any, any other insight onto fish ladders? Um, I don't know if there are too many details yet about how the fish lift would be operated. Um, <clears throat> so far, I haven't seen the, the diagrams or anything for it because they were considered to be critical infrastructure and are not public documents, but I've been trying to get a copy of them. Um, uh, so that's probably to be determined as time goes on. Um, and then, in terms of dismantling the other facilities, um, the application does say that they would be pulled out the first year that the lift gets operated. But um, it's my opinion that, or our opinion, that they need to stay in until we know these things are working well. Okay, great. Um... This is a little bit about the process. It, seem, it seems like you weighed in on the license application well before the May time frame for intervention. How does this work? It seems we have weighed in. Um, yeah, I kind of answered that question in okay. the chat in the short version is basically that, you know, Andrea pointed to the what will be the public comment period sometime after May. You can comment to FERC at any time you want, um, <laughs> really. And what we have been doing is providing, uh, you know, some groups have been providing comments now 
to ask questions about the current applications, missing information that should have been in the application that perhaps wasn't, and point out deficiencies in the application in the hope that FERC over the course of the next couple of months will turn around and then require additional information from the companies before we get to that more open formal public comment period on what is deemed the final complete application. So there's a bit of an iterative process here. And uh, you know, some groups are putting comments in now to sort of urge FERC to make sure that we get the, the best and most detailed information. Great. You know, I'm realizing that a couple of people um, sent a, a question directly to me that that isn't viewable to, to you guys. So um, I don't know how many more you have to go through, but let's try to leave some time for those as well. Yeah, there, there's quite a few and we probably won't get <laughs> to all of them. So okay. um, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, if, you, if you have one there that you see that um, uh, would be of interest to, to many, it's a little hard to pick since we just have about five minutes to go. Um, yeah. Uh, well, here's, here's one. Assuming that the various mitigations will be monitored for efficacy, if they do not work as intended, is there any provision to require that first light will make good on what is promised? And, and so, you know, what's the enforcement and mechanism? Well, so right now, um, what they submit is, is their application and FERC, um, will have a say in terms of, and so do the, um, the state and federal agencies as to what will be in the license. Once it's really in a license and they're required to operate that way, um, that is something enforceable by, by law. So they can you know, either be sued or fined or whatever. Okay. Um, some of these have been answered by Kathy. Um, do you want to try one of the questions that you you received? Um, sure. One question was, how clean is the water in the two dam area discussed today? Um, there was a water quality study that looked more like at temperature and dissolved oxygen. Um, CRC does some bacteria analysis. I would say um, the water quality, based on what I know, is pretty good in that area. Um, the main thing is below the dam. Um, because there's so little flow now, there can be some areas where that don't support fish habitat. Um, and then what does entrainment mean? It means um, getting pulled through the turbines. You hear the words impingement and entrainment. Impinged is getting a fish stuck against like a rack and they can't swim away from it. So they're, they're killed that way. Entrainment would mean they go through the turbines. So there's a question here that I also got directed message to me. How do tiny insect larvae and shad babies get screened safely by the net? So that, you know, in terms of they what don't. you were just mentioning. They don't. They don't. <laughs> so that's an impact that um, is unaddressed. First Light, their study basically said that even though millions of <clears throat> shad eggs are entrained, um, that only translates to a few hundred adult shad. And so therefore it's not a big impact and they're not proposing to do anything about it. So um, the arguments against that I've heard is just that that doesn't, that kind of assumption isn't necessarily valid and it also assumes that the only value of shad is the adult stage that that there aren't any other habitat values at the younger life stages 
Andrea, there was a question about the, will the um, new proposed fish lift be based on the existing lift at Holyoke? So can you talk a little bit about how those things get designed? Um, I'm not sure I can answer that too well. I don't know what the design is or what it will be. Certainly in my mind, because there's one in Holyoke, like I think of it as similar to Holyoke. Holyoke has two elevators at different locations. It's a whole different configuration. So I don't exactly know, but the hope, I think what the proposal is, is that it would lift fish from the base of the dam <coughs> up direct, <coughs> excuse me, directly into the impoundment and not have to go, go through the gatehouse situation that they currently have to go through. Beyond that, I don't, I can't really tell you much. <laughs> Just stay tuned. Um, yeah. I see a, a sort of four part question from Gia. So since there's probably time for one more question, if you want to pick the one that's burning for you, um, that would be lovely. And, and again, just before you, while you think about that, just to remind folks that Andrea and Kathy are going to have a, a, an extra coffee hour, just Q and A time uh, a week from Friday at 1030. And I'll send more information about that. And if there's a lot of interest, um, we're happy to, to do more of these um, in the months ahead. It's great to see all this. Yeah, and we can questions. probably linger a little bit to try to answer a few additional questions for, you know, we just want to be respectful of the folks who need to uh, end at one, so. Well, thank you all for, for this rich uh, sharing. And uh, I don't have to struggle to decide, I, 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 you know, I don't want to dominate, but so I'm responding. I'm seeing other questions along the same lines. We heard from Tom, elephant in the room, what are, some of the least unrealistic scenarios in which the main stem stream dams could be removed. And that intersects with my question is, are you aware of who is talking about and how we can connect with folks who are uh, considering non-renewal of license altogether, licenses? Um. Yeah, a lot of people have asked us about this over the years and um, certainly thinking to the like Androscoggin or river scenario. Um, I guess our thought, one thing that we have been working on is requiring in this license a decommissioning fund similar to what exists for um, nuclear power plants. Because as um, the energy market changes, it's possible that some of these dams over the next 50 years may no longer be economically viable. And we also um, spent some grant money to look at whether converting um, some of the peaking that's going on at dams could be <clears throat> changed, the operations could change and there could be battery storage um, not pump storage, but battery storage as a companion to this. And it just seems, you know, possible that with a lot of solar people having solar power at their homes and potentially batteries at their home, that maybe there'd be less of a need for some of these facilities over the long term. Um, and that there should be a funding source for decommissioning. As to which of these dams could come out realistically, we just don't know. I mean, um, ecologically, Holyoke, <laughs> you know, it's the first dam on the river upstream. It has a big effect. So that, but that's, you know, whether or not that could ever be dismantled, I just have no idea. It's also a critical part of, you know, that city's identity. Same thing with Turner's Falls also. So, well, current identity could be different over the long term. But um, Burke doesn't necessarily look at that unless it's a true 
economic proposal and right now these things are making money i don't know kathy if you want to add to that at all yeah i think uh, you know you would have to have the uh, the confluence of several things occur you know i think um they would have to be from an economic perspective not doing well because there's such an uh, incredible shift in how we generate our electricity that they're kind of not needed anymore and uh they play a particular niche in the grid that is at the moment not uh, cannot be played by solar or, or wind. So, um, you know, it. I don't. Certainly, it's not going to happen in this relicensing. And then the question would be, uh, you know, there are several policy questions. One is this idea of providing for a decommissioning pathway and money to be put aside. And then you would actually need federal policy to uh, do that. Right now, FERC does not, you know, in the eighties, they considered that idea and uh, they basically don't support it and don't require it, which is absurd. Um, <clears throat> so there's sort of starting with that policy shift and then, uh, you know, needing to anticipate like pretty severe changes, I think, in how the grid works. Uh, I'm just going to interject a little bit to make sure people know you can get off the line anytime you're ready. I want to thank everybody for joining. We are at we are after one o'clock. Um, particularly, thank you so much to Andrea for the in-depth presentation and Kathy for helping answer questions. And um, you know, folks who do want to hang out a little bit longer, I think um, we can we can do that. And again, come back on the fifth for we'll we'll send that information and and our future live streams on other great topics concerning our rivers. So thanks for being here. So maybe another ten minutes or so. Sure, for folks who yeah. who can. Um, Catherine Lane asked about do we know the Mass State Agency's opinion about the to, the new license proposals. um we have briefed with them i think they're pouring over it just like us and probably will withhold judgment until they're officially in the 401 water quality certificate stage or after they've issued it um somebody asked me directly about what about building a lower basin for Northfield Mountain off river? And that is something that we have uh, proposed. I see John Bennett <laughs> grinning <laughs> in the audience. <laughs> um, Mason's pool. Mason's pool, Mason Phelps. Uh, the company believes that it basically would be akin to creating a whole new facility and they have said they're not considering it. Um, doesn't hurt for everybody to keep poking and prodding. Um, we've also brought up the possibility of a partial lower reservoir that maybe could um, reduce the amount of constant fluctuation, but that also hasn't been addressed in any way. So, yep, you're on our wavelength, but unfortunately it's fallen on deaf ears so far. Um, uh, I, and I think uh, John reminded me of something I mentioned in a meeting last night, which is that the, most of this information you only get if you actually subscribe to the FERC docket. So we encourage people to subscribe uh, to the FERC docket so you get emails directly from FERC if anything has been filed on this relicensing process. So both Great River Hydro and First Light have public websites where they've been posting their information, like the application or whatever, um, you know, the study reports, the work that they have done. But any of the other comments that are provided for uh, by us or other recreation organizations or you know anyone else only ends up in the FERC docket and you can uh, register to receive those. So you can sort of track the conversation as it were in terms of how people are responding and, and what they're saying and then be notified when the public comment period opens. Um, 
And we do have, you know, in the email, we'll have a link to some details on our, our website about how you do that. But we're also glad to just help you individually uh, get signed up if, if you want to. If you have a question, I would say feel free to unmute at this point and, and uh, put up your hand or something so that we can, we can hear you. Okay, last, last chance, and then we'll, um, we'll close for the day. Uh, huge reminder, please, um, with all the new info that you've learned today to make your voices heard by submitting comments directly to FERC or to our Power of Water, Power of Words website. And um, let's work together to make the best possible outcome for our river. Thanks so much for coming.